must be a year of action for race and inclusion in sport. It's brought to you in association with British Future and the Asian Media Group. Uncle Desai sends his apologies for not being able to chair today's live event. My name is Barney Chowdhury and I'm an editor at large for Eastern Eye. Uh, I'm honoured, humbled and delighted to be with you for the next 75 minutes. I know that we've got some stellar organisations in our audience, so may I thank you in advance uh, for joining us and I look forward to asking some of your questions later. So before I start to chair this panel discussion, let me explain that racism in cricket and more widely in sport is something I've been reporting on for the past 40 plus years, uh, formerly for the BBC and now for my newspaper. Of course, a lot's happened over the past few months. Uh, the stunningly honest and heartbreaking story of Azim Rafiq is now well known. We know that since he blew the whistle on racism, much has been written and discussed. In fact, it's a story that's not going away, is it? Even today, we had an apology from Yorkshire's interim coach, Ryan Sidebottom, for saying that the club should try and forget the Azim Rafiq scandal. <laughs> I'd love to have been a fly on the wall at his meeting with Lord Patel of Bradford, who's overseeing much needed change at the club. So to help me unpick and make sense of where we are and just as important, where we should be heading in sport and cricket, I have a great panel of experts. Sunder Katwala is the director of British Future, an independent and non-partisan think tank which works on identity and immigration, integration and race relations with a focus on engaging the public constructively in issues which can be polarising and divisive. Halima Khan is the founder and director of Opening Borders, a not-for-profit organisation which harnesses the power of sport and channels it into community cohesion, gender equality and all-round better health for communities. James Butler is an experienced radio broadcaster and a sports journalist who runs and presents the Cricket Badger podcast the biggest independent cricket podcast panel. Welcome and thank you for joining us. So, James, let me start off with you first. Um, you actually broke the Azim Rafiq story in great detail uh, in, in August 2020. Uh, could you just talk us through exactly what happened? Um, I knew Azim. I, I mean, I come from this from three distinct kind of viewpoints, really. I was a, a fan of Yorkshire County Cricket Club. I then worked for Yorkshire County Cricket Club as the media manager um, I knew Azim during that period, uh, and then ever since I've covered it as a broadcaster and journalist. And um, I interviewed Azim on my podcast in August 2020. He'd done a an interview with Wisden um, a week or two before that, but we got a bit further into the racism stuff. I'd had Michael Carberry on my podcast about two months prior to that, where that had gone a bit viral when he'd said racism is rife in cricket, um, and then off the back of that. Um, I started to take a bit more interest, to be honest. Um, to my shame, I, it's not something that had ever really kind of crossed my path before. Um, but when Azim came on and talked on my podcast, then we talked off record and we spoke pretty much every day since August 2020. Obviously, it opened my eyes quite widely and I tried to support him and get the story out there. So um, you were involved with the club since 20, for a long time, since 2007, I think. I worked for the club for six years. Yeah, so when you were there, you, you didn't see any of the vibes that, that, that have now come out? I, I think it's um, with institutional racism and with, obviously, from Azim's um, allegations, they were very specific to him. I'm not saying I never saw anything that made me feel uncomfortable when I was at the club, because I did. But I didn't. it's not something where you walk around the corridors of power at Headingley and everybody's using the P words every five seconds. That isn't how it, that isn't how it was at all. Yeah, never does. Um, but so obviously, from Azim's personal point of view, it was something that hit him very hard and hit him. I mean, having having spoken to him over the last um, eighteen months, two years, whatever it's been now, um, I know how low he's felt at various stages in the process, and it's really affected his life. I mean, well documented that he, he considered suicide um, while still a player. Um, he reported his allegations in twenty seventeen and twenty eighteen. The club just turned a blind eye and didn't do anything about it. And I think um, I've, I've heard a lot of people say he's only after the money. He's after trying, trying to kind of get some kind of reputational um, gain from this. I can say after speaking to him all the way through this process, never mentioned money once. Um, it was all about just 
having the respect from the club that they you know that they listened to him and acted appropriately if the need arose. Uh, thanks, James. H Halima, you too have links with the club. Would you explain what they are? Yeah, thank you, Barney. So I've done quite a lot of stuff with the club over the last five or ten years, uh, mainly on a voluntary basis. So quite a bit of coaching with them. There was a stint around 2015, if I remember um, rightly, that I was managing the Yorkshire under-15s team. And I've done quite, a, um, as you mentioned, with my organisation, Opening Boundaries. We've held quite a few events linked in with Yorkshire County Cricket Club and I'm raising awareness of women, South Asian communities um, and issues around gender inequality in sport. Uh, and what, when you were there inside Headingley and, and working with the, with the club, with the women's cricketers, what, what were your experiences? Uh, what I was, I was going to say, Barney, at under 15, you definitely don't get the privileges of uh, coaching inside at Headingley or even stepping onto the uh, to the turf to play a game. Perhaps we should change them. Our, our game, the, the under 15, maybe that is something that should be changed. The under 15, if they're going to be called under 15 Yorkshire women's cricket, they should be able to play at the ground. Um, but, you know, the environment, if I'm honest with you, you could tell that there were quite a lot of clicks. Parents kind of knew the coaches, coaches knew the parents and... It was almost this system where, it, you know, talent at time didn't matter. But if you had the right parent, you were going to go up the kind of player pathway. But it's not to say that there were people in there trying to get through the through the kind of talent and the player pathways. I think it was it was sometimes, from my opinion, seen as a bit of a closed shop. So you would always see the same people coming through the system, coming through the talent pathways. And there was no really room for others to come into that or it would be quite difficult for them to come into that environment. I've heard that quite a lot from people I've spoken to. One of the things they say is that, of course, cricket is expensive uh, and you've got to buy the gear and uh, the coaches speak to one another. So you can almost be blackballed. Did you ever come across that in, in your uh, in yeah, your and it's, it is an expensive sport. Um, and the challenge that you have is, one, you can turn up with equipment. But actually, when you've got... Um, you know, some of the county girls that are there from affluent backgrounds, you know, the parents have got that disposable income to pay £200 for a bat, to pay £90 for, you know, pads and so on. You don't have that income. So you're turning up with the bare minimum. There's also a complexion issue that you then start to have. So if you do get players coming in from kind of Asian and ethnic backgrounds, when they're looking at their counterparts, they don't feel like they belong in that environment. Because guess what? My bat cost me about 20 quid because it's all I can really afford. And you know, people are there with their, and, and that's not to say that, you know, they've got that income, they can spend that on how they want, but it is the environment and that can start to feel quite uncomfortable. And I can understand why if you're a young Asian girl, or even if you're a young black girl, you sometimes come into the environment thinking I'm going to play for my county, I want to then go and play for my country. But you slowly start to detach because you don't feel like you belong in that environment and you can't keep up with the, with the pace of the other girls, not just from a player's perspective, but a athletic side but also from a kind of I haven't got the best kit every season or my kit isn't brand new every time I start the season. Thank you Halima. Uh, Sundar let, let's let's turn to you uh, and let's broaden it a little bit because I read your um, um, your interview with Press Association about the fact that social media has a lot and, and that you've been a victim of racism in, in, in football. Um, uh, just, just tell us a bit about your experiences in sport uh, and and what's been happening in terms of in terms of uh, racism? Well, I think I think sport is so important. I think to identity, race, social connection in our country. You know, it's a sport mad country for lots of people, not not everybody. But it's also really formative. So you know, I had you know to the extent that I had views about identities. You know, what was open or close to me in terms of being, you know, Indian or English or British or Everton Football Club or Yorkshire Cricket Club. You know, you you have an experience, you have a formative experience of that as a seven year old, eight year old, 11 year old before you start to have views about those ideas about identity when you're 15, 16, 18. So, you know, my my first experience of sport was just being absolutely football mad as a seven year old and on a sort of three or four year long campaign to be allowed to be taken to a match because my friend Andrew could be taken for a match. So it's quite a nice. Eve, I think, seven-year-old, we're in sort of Merseyside in the in the early mid-80s here. But I eventually got to go to the matches, you know, went to a lot of football matches. But by the time I was a teenager, the kind of overt racism you could hear and see because Liverpool had signed John Barnes and Everton had no black players. 
was absolutely astonishing. So I'm slightly in the position of maybe, you know, wanting, have I picked the wrong team here? My fellow supporters are singing Everton or White at the opposing team because they've got this England star. And that, that was my route into social, you know, issues, campaigning, identity, the kind of work I do it arose out of my teenage experience of Norman Tebbit saying, you know, why didn't your dad support England? And that experience at Everton Football Club. Um, I've, I feel, you know, I feel I'm in my 40s. I've seen change in our society for the better across the generations quite powerfully, but I've also lost that change in the last three years personally because I'm back to getting more racism in my life every day than I have at any other point for the last 30 years because I talk about race in public. I'm one click away from you know any bigot in the country. If I want to say England brings us all together, that's really happening, then you know 90% of people agree with that. Now, the people who don't, they can they can harass me. And if Twitter and the police don't do anything about that, and sadly they don't, then then I'm, you know, I'm in a worse position than I was when I was 11, you know, because we dealt in the football stadium with that racism by, by sort of 1994. You couldn't do it anymore. You got policed, you got chucked out, kick it out had been founded and the culture shifted slowly. I think, over the generations. By Euro 96, it felt welcoming. It wasn't very diverse, but it felt less aggressive and less threatening. So different sports have been going on these different journeys. But I think I think sport drives the conversation because it's something we're interested in, something that brings us together potentially when it works or or something where, you know, the pain of, you know, segregation, separation being put in your own box is very evident from a very young age. If there's one thing about sport, it's very tribal, isn't it? You know, if you think about it for a second, it's you support Everton, I support Coventry, you know, and we meet on the football field sometimes. Um, and, and, and it's tribal from the moment we start. And then you've got the added complication of the fact that we're, we're people of colour uh, and, and that produces uh, even more uh, angst among the fans. But, you know, Barney, I think tribes are part of the answer here, potentially. And I think, you know, I think we used to think, you know, when I was 15, 16, you know, that sport just was something that brought out the worst in people. So football is about hooliganism, football is about racism, football is about nationalism. But if you want to have the tribe of we are Bradford, we are Leeds, we are Yorkshire, we are Everton, we are Liverpool, we are England, and everybody's invited, then it's actually a really powerful thing to aspire to and get. And I think what, you know, that you know, Everton is much more like that as an idea, you know, now than it was then. But there are always people working for that to be the case, you know. So in places like, you know, Leeds United or Bradford, there's been that argument over decades. So I think, you know, Yorkshire County Cricket Club was the institution that cricket missed an opportunity for half a century in this country because, you know, it wants to be the national sport. It's been slipping away and you had Commonwealth communities who came in thinking it was the number one sport. And I think cricket lost the black community. It never lost the Asian communities, but it somehow, somehow it's a story of separateness across Yorkshire. So Yorkshire County Cricket Club is the institution we most want to get it right in a way. And that's why it's such a tragedy that there's so much work still to do. Alima, you're actually uh, in Yorkshire. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just wonder, from your viewpoint, what you see happening as a result of the fallout of Azim Rafiq's uh, whistleblowing, uh, how it's affecting communities, how it's affecting sport, how it's what, what, what's the feeling on the ground? Um, sure, Bonnie. I just wanted to um, comment, Sunder, on your point there about the kind of tribes and, you know, the divides there. From my perspective, especially at a grassroots level, I always saw the opposite. Sport was the only place that I would come and I would see so much diversity. So when I would come and play and coach in the teams, I would see, you know, a kind of demographic of different people. I wouldn't see that if I just went out in my community or I, you know, because of the environment that I was brought in and living in Bradford, very predominantly South Asian communities. It was only the only time when I started playing cricket that I would see, you know, women of different diverse backgrounds, both physically um, and unseen diversity as well. You know, when I'm talking to them, they've just got so many different backgrounds. I think the divide, and again, it's my opinion, starts to happen when you move up that ladder, when you move away from the participation, you move away from the grassroots, and then you're trying to get into the, I suppose, as you mentioned there, that, that system of club environment. And that's when you start to see maybe less and less of it. 
in answer to your question, Barney, I think with regards to what has this done in communities and people, I think it's lost a lot of trust. Yorkshire and, and even the England Cricket Board, you know, only a few years ago developed the South Asian strategy and there was so much resource that was put behind it. And I've seen myself some of the efforts and interventions that her Yorkshire have put in place to try and engage with South Asian communities. And it's really sad in one sense that I feel like all of that has gone. Nobody remembers that anymore because of what's happened now with the Azim Rafiq case and lots more people are coming forward and talking about their experiences. So whilst it's really sad on that side just to, to, be, to see that and think all of these years of work in the South Asian strategy hasn't, you know, really maybe hit the mark where they wanted to. At the same time, it's also a strong, you know, Azim Rafiq has been really strong in coming forward and it needed to be done. So it's such a mix of emotion where you go from it was really strong and brave and that needed to be done to then equally at the same time saying, but it's really sad as well for this sport that we've come to this and, you know, personally on a personal level, you know, I love cricket, watch it, play it, coach it. And I've worked with so many young people and, and you know, adults in, in club environments trying to engage through sport, but use it as a, a wider social tool as well around cohesion, community, bringing people together. And this very much is doing the opposite of that. So we have to take the opportunity that's come out of all of this and try to change the face of, of cricket and, you know, sport maybe in, in general around inclusion. One of the things that Azim said was that he wouldn't let his son or daughter play cricket. Yeah. Um, and, and I just wondered whether that was still the purveying mood in, in, in Yorkshire. I mean, I've had parents say that to me uh, over the last few months. Parents who have got young girls and young boys who are playing club cricket or even just participatory sport saying this is the reason why we don't want them to engage in sport this is the reason why we'd rather they're focused on what they see as a an academic education and gain a good qualification so that they can get jobs and they can make something of themselves what it is is that they now don't have trust in the institution there was very little trust in thinking that you could make a career out of sport anyway being from a South Asian background so that's half the battle sometimes but actually now I feel like there's even little trust to say that well even if you do make it into sport, I've seen how you get treated and I don't want my son or my daughter to go through that. Mm -hmm. James, um, one of the things that you mentioned was that you speak to Azim on a regular basis. So what is he making of uh, what's going on right now and what Yorkshire are trying to do and perhaps the uh, other clubs as well in, in county cricket that we've heard about? I think with Azim it's worth just kind of going back a step and thinking about how Yorkshire dealt with his situation. Because to me, there were two very distinct parts of Azim's allegations or, or the overall picture. There was initially his allegations of racism and institutional racism at the club. And then the secondary, there was the um, scant disregard of the club to what he'd actually said and the fact that they completely ignored what he'd said. And I think it was actually that that actually bit Yorkshire on the backside rather than the actual racism itself, which is quite sad. It was the fact that they mismanaged the, the situation. Um, they kind of adopted a bunker mentality where they hoped it would go away. And I I, I think in, in, in society in general, but certainly in cricket, there's probably three things that actually make people take racism seriously. I think there's the, the potential bad PR. If it's going to affect individuals and their reputations, then they do something. I think there's financial loss. If it's going to affect a company economically, they do something. And then as we saw it, well, we've seen all, all excuse me, nearly dropped my phone. As we've seen all three of these in the uh, Azim Rafiq case, the political intervention, and if it gets bigger than the, the organization itself, and all, all three of those, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, affected Yorkshire County Cricket Club. I, I say unfortunately, because I think as a fan, I'm very sad with where Yorkshire are at the moment. And I think, yeah, we, myself and Azim have had this conversation regularly with both Yorkshire fans. Yeah, he played for the club. He's very proud to have a Yorkshire cap. He's, he represented that organisation with pride and, and with passion. And, you know, one, one thing I always, that always makes me, um, confuses me to a degree, is how the people in charge at Yorkshire didn't, they didn't know Azim. Because if you actually watch Azim play and if you'd spoken to Azim, you know that he's a, an obstinate so-and-so. He, he, you know, the way he played, he was a fighter, he was a scrapper. 
And he was never going to let this go. Um, and the club were very naive, I think, in that they thought that this would just blow over and, and disappear. And that was their undoing. And I, you know, just kind of to repeat, I think the actual allegations of racism, if they'd actually, well, first of all, if they dealt with it initially, if they'd actually taken his allegations seriously, taken appropriate action, listened to him, it would never have got this far. It certainly wouldn't have got as far as the DCMS hearing. Um, but the, the fact that they didn't do um, is actually more of their undoing than the actual racism itself, which is the wrong way around, isn't it? You know, you, you should be in the dock for racism, not for how you mismanage the allegations of racism. Both are bad, um, don't get me wrong. But I, I think it's also worth, um, Barney, just making the point that this isn't just a Yorkshire problem. Yeah, York, Yorkshire are very much in the headlines at the moment because of the way they mismanaged Azum's allegations. But this, the, there are whistleblowing hotlines around the country. There are people coming forward from all of the 18 counties um, giving their experiences of, of racism in the past. Um, and I think Yorkshire have been unlucky in a way that they've had somebody as obstinate as Azim who dug his heels in and wouldn't let this go. Because I think the thing I've, I've noticed more than anything talking to Azim all the way through this was how it affected him personally, how somebody that comes forward and is, is brave enough and confident enough or desperate enough to actually make the allegations in the first place isn't seen as being the solution. He's seen as being the problem. And I've spoken to a lot of people during the last 18 months since I interviewed Azim who have said that, you know, I, I have got issues, but I don't come forward because it might actually affect my future employment opportunities. It might affect my ability to go into coaching. I might lose that contract or I might, you know, I'll be seen as an issue. Um, and I think a lot of people want to blend into the background and just have a, an easy life or a more comfortable life. And actually doing what Azim's done, putting your head on the block and getting yourself out there. We've seen how people, you know, there was... During the DCMS thing, there was an outpouring of sympathy and emotion for Azim. How can this have been allowed to happen to one individual? Azim's never painted himself as being an angel. None of us are angels. None of us are perfect. And Azim's done things wrong in the past. And obviously, the backlash that came off the back of the DCMS hearing, you know, digging up quotes from the past and trying to discredit Azim in a way, was almost Cricket's way of squashing him. And that, that was something I saw quite a lot during the time speaking to him between the podcast and the DCMS, was there was a lot of attempts to try and discredit Azim and make him feel, you know, it's, it, Azim's the person at fault here, it's not the club at fault. And I think that is something which cricket, you know, if cricket's um, ever in denial about racism, it's that part of the process. Even if it is just somebody's perception that I might be damaged if I actually speak the truth. There is that perception that that is the landscape and that is wrong and cricket needs to do something about that. Sunday, you want to come in? Yeah, I think I think it's really interesting. It's necessary to have this reckoning. It's difficult. It's difficult for the people involved when people say, why did you put up with it? It's, it's difficult to take on. But it's really difficult and uncomfortable to have the reckoning. I think you've got to recognise that. So there's a real... You know, the reason they think it can go away is it has always gone away before. There's a great deal of offence at what, you know, Imran Khan said about Yorkshire and Asians and Pakistani community, you know, back in the 1999 World Cup and everyone said this isn't true at all. We haven't had any Asian players yet, but it will happen. So there was a feeling of progress, but it had gone away before and it didn't go away this time. And I think every sporting institution and a lot of other institutions be looking at why things are going to stay up now and that there were different interventions you know it was partly because of the anti-racism protests we had i think that changed the level of atmosphere you know made azim rafiq himself go back into it that totally changed how some of the politicians especially the sponsors responded and suddenly you've got you know tetley beer and have a good spring water you know pulling out because of um because of racism suddenly the ecb is saying well we'll pull out too and you've got a total collapse of governance in a way you weren't expecting. So that's that's a dramatic new pressure that people are under. We've now got this question, though, I think is really important. If we want to focus on the future, what do we do with all of the pain from the past? And I thought, in a way, the way in which Azim Rafiq was challenged about his anti-Semitic comments, had to own them, had to respond to them, actually gives him a model which I, I sort of sense he's saying when we, yeah, everyone's interested in the who said what to who, 
and what can we pin on individuals? Because we find it so hard to talk about institutions and so easy to talk about individuals. And what we want to do is make it possible for people and institutions and cultures to change. So I think we've got to find a way of hearing the experiences that people have had, doing something with them, recording them, and working out how to you know, forgive, move on, make people part of the solution. At the moment, we haven't offered, I think, you know, the members of Yorkshire County Cricket Club the role we want them to play in being part of the future. We're just saying to them, you should have been a bit more alert over the last 10, 15, 20 years. I'll come to you in a minute, James. I just want to ask Halima a quick question. You're listening to this. You're mm -hmm. a diversity inclusion expert. Um, why is it so difficult for people to uh, put the head above the parapet until, until there's a crunch moment? I think as... James mentioned something when, when you were talking and that, that really hit me in, in answering that, Barney, is when you talked about actually when we do come forward or when people of colour do come forward and talk about some of the discrimination that they're facing, sometimes they won't come forward out of fear, out of fear that actually this will jeopardise my chances, whether it's as an athlete, but I'm talking maybe from an administration level, you're working at a certain level in sport and you think if I want to climb up this career ladder, I want to become a director, I want to become a head of department. But if I start to talk about some of the challenges that there are in this current organisation and the culture and the way that it's run, you already feel that you have imposter syndrome. Then you start speaking and talking differently and you just think it's easy to remove that from an organisational point of view than actually listen to that. And, and this is the reason why you don't see many people in the hierarchies of sport. And for me, there has to be a cultural change, there has to be leadership, which is more visible. And we'll use Yorkshire as the example. Azim Rafiq came out and he talked about the head coach and he talked about the CEO. To this day, not that I'm aware of, have anything come out where they've acknowledged Azim's comments or even apologised for the way that they've handled it? They just seem to have vanished into the distance. And then you had Lord Patel come in, a person of colour, apologise to another person of colour and, and for me in this whole what's happened with Yorkshire is the one thing that I would probably disagree with Lord Patel on in that he shouldn't have apologised for something that he didn't do or and I know he's representing the organisation now but you acknowledge and you take that forward but if people don't look at it from their own personal and for me this comes back to people have to acknowledge that they are biased that there is racism that exists and only then, especially from a leadership point of view, can you move forward. Thank you. Uh, James, you wanted to come in and I cut you off. Um, yeah, I was just going to um, respond to something that Sundar said. I think, you know, the term cancel culture. Um, you know, we, we've seen, I think people say, have said things in the past. People have said things when they're teenagers. People have said, you know, some hor hor horrific things. But I think in, in the greater scheme of things we need to allow people to be different and i think if you cancel people because of something they've said that is racist and abhorrent and whatever else yes of course they need to be accountable and they need to take responsibility for things that they've said but i think if you just cancel them um completely you don't give anybody the chance to jump over the fence i always think of i don't know what the percent these percentages are right or wrong but so there's 90 percent of the world that is not racist and 10 percent that is but if you cancel everybody on the on the ten percent side of the fence and don't give them the chance to actually learn and be different and jump over the fence in twenty years' time, you can have exactly the same percentages. So you need to have the ability, to, I think. And I don't, I, I'm not clever enough to actually know how how to do this. But you need to obviously take responsibility and be accountable if you've done something um, racist. But you need to have some way where you can actually help that person or you know encourage that person to jump that fence and get onto the other side so that 90 percent goes up i'm going to uh um sort of take some questions from um uh, some of our listeners uh, some of our audience panel um and i want to broaden the debate out um so uh lee pinkerton um and who's with the cream project and for iqbal um sort of are asking that football racism has existed for so long why is it that we're only just now hearing about cricket uh, sundar um i think i think the challenges are, are different in football and, and cricket i think it's interesting that cricket never had a campaign like kick it out in football to challenge racism but i think part of the story here is that it was the kind of 
culture, the things that weren't said, you know, the nicknames. It wasn't it wasn't as overt most of the time as the sort of overt racism that, you know, the West Brom players faced in the 70s and 80s. So it was a different, different kind of issue. But it was also cricket is the sport with enormous minority participation and then the segregation of that participation. Whereas I think football's in a different place. I think the um, the Asian community is still a bit distant from from the football institutions. There's still work to do on... on because on, there aren't enough Asian players in the game. Yeah, and that, you know, it's, if, you, if, you're, if your parents, family didn't play, don't know the kind of link. So there's been a lot of stereotyping, I think, of Asians, why it's not going to happen, and it still needs to happen. So every sport... Every sport has a different has a different challenge. I think I think in cricket it's clear that there's enormous participation in the amateur game, but much too segregated uh, and much too separate, and therefore no real pathways into the professional game. But all other sports don't even have the diversity that cricket has had, and so most other sports, except for maybe athletics and boxing, you know, have got some diversity. Mostly, they're not even at the starting line. I would say, and people are saying the doors open. If people don't come, how do we know the problems with us, not with them? We don't know why there's nobody here, but we're perfectly inclusive. I think most sports haven't really started on the journey that football and cricket in different ways have been challenged to, to, to respond to. James, you're, you're a sports journalist. Um, do you agree with Sundar that, that what's going on is that there is this buy-in in cricket, but not elsewhere? Um, I think there's buy-in in cricket because cricket has been forced to buy-in um, because because they've been you know pushed into a corner. I think cricket is very was very happy with wearing t-shirts and having slogans in match day programs and stuff like that, and, and thinking that was enough to you know that was anti-racism. We're, we're fully inclusive. Look at the cricket landscape. There's people of all colours play cricket. You know, you, we we travel around the world and there's all all of these different cultures involved. So therefore, how can we be racist and um, the majority of people that are making the decisions in cricket, having said that, are white people, the people that look like me, um, who are sitting around board tables making, um, make, probably making very well-intentioned um, decisions, but they're making well-intentioned decisions from their own background and from, the, from their own perspective and not really going out there and considering how, how that affects other people. I mean, I, there's the 12-point plan that the ECB have brought in off the back of the Azim stuff, they've got this 12-point plan about how they're going to develop cricket and make it more inclusive going forward. I, I think the key thing with that is to actually go out to cultures, to different cultures, and actually make them own that plan. You know, actually, a lot of people at Lords saying, right, we're having this 12-point plan, this is the way we're going to move forward, this is where we're going to be more inclusive. That's good, and it's a good starting point, but you need to involve everybody in that, because if you end up being... Um, just going to a, a cricket club in Bradford and saying, right, this is the 12-point plan, this is how it's going to work. That's just a white guy telling um, other people how, how how this is going to operate, isn't it? You need to make people actually own the sport and own the changes in the sport. Otherwise, um, it's going to be something that's dictated to to people and that, that isn't a very healthy way forward. But I, I, I think Azim and, and what we've got now has given Yorkshire a golden cricket a golden ticket, not just Yorkshire. The whole cricket. sport, actually, the whole absolutely, sport. and and probably why further afield, because you you have the chance now because there's a reason to because it's got as far as it has done and it's blown up as big as it has. You've got the chance to actually draw a line in the sand and have that watershed moment where you can be different and you have an excuse almost as a committee or a board or or whatever to actually make these changes off the back of what Azim's given you. And and basically take everything back to, um, to to square one and be honest and be truly open and say right you know, we've made mistakes in the past this hasn't been ideal we're going to involve everybody we're going to talk to people we're going to actually you know join hands around the county I mean Yorkshire's Yorkshire the thing about um, Yorkshire is it actually represents everybody in the county doesn't it and Yorkshire is such a massive county which is yeah. Uh, you know, wonderful scenery, wonderful people, but wonderful people of all kinds of different backgrounds. And I don't think at the moment or in the past, the club has properly represented all of those people. I know from being at the club and working on the management team ahead of internationals where, you know, people described the Asian population of Bradford as being a revenue stream or they were potential ticket buyers. They weren't ever really people. And I think, you know, the club needs to view people as people, not as potential sales. 
and that's a big difference it's a you know it's only a, probably a slight change but you know actually talking to people actually what do you want to see you know what where do you want to see the club going is this your club why is it not your club actually really properly talking to people from different communities and involving them and making them feel like it is their club i mean the term club is kind of everybody in it together kind of thing at the moment i think a lot of county clubs aren't that it's about humanizing um halima dr manish tile mbe from the royal navy says good afternoon i put it to the panel that the only difference between yorkshire county cricket club both in the racism itself and the handling of it and any other major uk institution is that they got caught um and i just wonder whether you agree with that and he asks what are the key lessons for other organizations and their people well yes is they it obviously they got caught. caught um but i don't think it's just about the fact that they got caught i think it's about it's the way they handled it as well there wasn't an acceptance from the club that they were racist you had the ex-chairman, I think it was the day after he resigned, came on, um, I don't know if it was a radio interview or on TV, and openly still said, I don't believe anybody at Yorkshire is racist. So for me, it very much goes back to people have to own their own levels of bias. And if some of that bias leads to racism, to say that, well, you are racist, but you have to be able to accept that first. So I think, yes, they got caught but there was also no acknowledgement from being caught. And we've talked about this previously here, you know, in the way that they handled it, it wasn't just about the racism, it became this handling more than the actual racism itself. And I think, you know, the lessons for other organisations to learn is, um, you know, James, you talked about it a little bit before, is shared ownership. It's co-producing. So the ECB have developed a 12-point plan. They've got four main ambitions that they want to achieve from that. But actually, how much are they working with the counties and the clubs to say, how do we do this? Because we're not just going to dictate to you how this needs to be delivered so and by when. Your argument is it's top down and what it really needs is a community engagement. Yeah, because I think if you want communities and if we use Yorkshire as the example, if we want Yorkshire to feel like cricket is for them and that club, they, want, they are a part of that club. It has to be a shared, whether it's a document, whether it's an intervention, it needs to be co-produced which then leads to shared ownership. I know that if I'm in, involved in something from the onset to make a change and to meet that bigger goal and vision of being more inclusive, I'm sat on that table from the start of that conversation. They haven't come to me after producing the document with an action plan and a timeline and then saying, we need to do this. Can you do that bit of it? Because the first thing I'll turn around and say, no. Because <laughs> they go, you didn't ask. You, you haven't understood my world. You haven't understood my world, my culture, my environment, but you want me to do this for you. So I think there needs to be more conversations. And yes, them conversations will be very uncomfortable to start off with, but we will eventually lead to a comfortable position where people will start to feel like I am a part of this club. So therefore, the change has to happen from all of us. And it's not, yes, there's a responsibility around governance for the clubs and the administrators, but actually everyone owns Yorkshire Cricket Club. You know, I'm from Bradford. I'm a Yorkshire woman I want to be able to go to that club and say I'm proud to come to this club it is a part of me it's part of the history that I'm involved in so I think there's that one side of shared sorry co-production with your communities and then shared leadership and ownership from that but the other thing I'd probably suggest is in order to get to that point and for you to be able to understand communities and people a bit better is you know reverse mentoring if you don't know of a particular community and culture and some of the challenges that they might have go and find out talk to them I do that you know I'm no expert in all the protected characteristics and all the equality laws but I know that if I don't know something I will go and find somebody who's got a lived experience in that and I will go to the effort of trying to find out what is it that I can be doing in my everyday work to ensure that I'm creating more inclusive environments and it's not just me sat behind a desk thinking I know what the best thing to do is thank you uh Sundar and then James. I think there's a big lesson for every institution in sport and beyond sport, which is that all institutions are going to have to get more confident talking about race, talking about difference and so on. And there's no institution in this country that is fully confident about that. And you only get that confidence if you've got those relationships. So if you're famous, if you're iconic, then you might be more likely to get caught in the spotlight if things go wrong and less able to brush it away. But you look at the census results that we're going to get, this is growing diversity in our 
country, you're going to have to get more confident about it. If those relationships are very distant, if that feels a very anxious thing to embark on, then you've got to work hard at building better relationships in the way that Halima said. But this idea about shared ownership, James is absolutely right that you need the shared ownership of the plan with the communities. I think there's been too much diversity as outreach, diversity for minorities. Let's have a conversation with the minorities about diversity and then have the usual conversation with everybody else about everybody, everything else. And that isn't shared ownership. So it's as important to have the shared ownership of the majority community, of the membership, of the plans, of the conversation and so on. And that's where I think, you know, it's a really interesting challenge for somebody like Lord Patel, who I think has done well as a leader in the tone that he struck. People will say, you know, the club should you know, connect across communities, make this better. He should turn to the members, I think, and say, you know, it's your job to help us reach out, build these bridges. You've got to play a part in this. Otherwise, people are sort of sitting there with their arms folded a bit, saying, you know, we've, we've got to be seen to do something about this because of that fuss, but we're looking forward to it going away. They've got to be asked to step up. I had a very positive experience, Barney. Um, uh, my next-door neighbour is a Charlton fan, um, as it happens here in Kent. And um, Charlton are in League One at the moment, and they get crowds of fourteen or 15,000 in a stadium that holds 27,000. So all of the season ticket holders were given uh, three free tickets for a match and said, well, you know, let's see if we can fill the stadium. And so, um, you know, my nine-year-old got to go to her first football match having, uh, you know, filled in the Euro 2020 world chart because he said, look, we're trying to fill the stadium. Do your children want to go? And I think that's something you could put to the members of Yorkshire. Can you bring people into this ground next season who are younger, um, who are women, who are from different communities and different backgrounds, you know, some of the members of the Yorkshire County Club don't have those relationships. Some of them do. That shouldn't just be for the club to do. I think it should be for the whole community to actually try to do that bridging. Can I, can I just really quickly jump in there on, yeah. on that point in that what I will say is that there's three entities to Yorkshire County Cricket Club. You've got the Cricket Club, the board and the foundation. And I know over the last couple of years, the board and the foundation have been working very hard where they have offered these opportunities. So that's two communities, especially during the 100, where they've given free tickets away to come in, enjoy kind of the perks of the club, just that whole club environment. Because I think one thing that does for younger generation is it's an aspiration. It inspires them to then want to be able to say, I am a part of this club and maybe I can get into the setup, whether it's as a player, whether it's as a coach or an administrator. So I think in everything that we're talking about, there are things that are happening, unfortunately, because of the Azim Rafiq thing. Well, I say unfortunately, it's good that it's come out. Some of that stuff is being kind of swept out of the way of what, what the clubs have been doing as well, which has been quite positive as well. Uh, James, Amir Khan, um, and I'm presuming it's not the boxer Amir Khan, or, or the actor, Bollywood star Amir Khan, um, says that reflective role models can play a part uh, what two things would the panel want to see for immediate change? Can, can I just come back on just one thing that was said um, about being caught? I think it's important to remember, I'm, I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet here, I think it's important to remember that Yorkshire got called out by the press. They yeah. didn't get called out by cricket. They didn't get called out by necessarily the support, supporters until it kind of grew a little bit of a head of steam. Um, if it hadn't been for myself and George DeBell in you know, who writes for ESPN Crick Info, who continue to write stories on this and continue to put pressure on the club to do differently. A, that independent investigation that wasn't independent wouldn't have happened. And B, it wouldn't have ended up where it did do. So I think um, the game needs to look at itself in terms of the reporting mechanisms and in terms of how it actually views um, incidents of racism, because I think it's very easy um, in cricket to, um, as the questioner suggested, to kind of, um, you know, sweep it under the table to some degree and what as well I mean my, my concern is that what is a headline one day in the UK people have very short attention spans and people move on to something else it'll be Boris one day it'll be Azim the next and it'll be England playing football the next and people move on don't they and we need to have somehow you know as as a country as a, as a community as people that just care um, about doing the right thing we need to keep people accountable we need to keep the pressure on for change it's very very easy this 12 point plan that the ecb announced before christmas i've not heard of it since um yeah. and so we're, we're gonna, we're, we're, i think it's our job isn't it as press to yeah. hold the, to but the, the yeah the, ash, the ashes comes up and all the yeah. fallout from the ashes yeah. that starts to hit the headlines and it's very easy to kind of 
you know to lose momentum with something so we need to and that this is all you know i think it's important to say as well it's important that white people own racism and and are part of the process and um talk to people and understand it but i think it comes from all different cultures you know all different cultures are at fault to various degrees with racism um and i think we need we need to be open to that as well and in the same way that um you know we all need to kind of learn and grow and understand people's cultures that works every single which way i think okay look i want to go back to the amir khan question in in, in just a moment but uh Bulja, uh karabhadra said i'm the chairman of luton town an indians cricket, cricket, county cricket club in bedfordshire one of the most diverse cricket clubs in the country the 12 point plan from the ecb is a step in the right direction but is in danger of becoming a tick box exercise because the point you make, Halima, which is that there's been no consultation at grassroots. So let's go to the Amir Khan question, which is what two things would the panel, starting off with you, if I may, Halima, uh, would you want to would you want to see for immediate change? So I suppose the first one is that co-production, because co-production will lead to sh will lead sorry to shared ownership. You feel a part of something you're more likely to put more time effort and passion into bringing that to life um and i suppose my second thing and i, and I think i'm going to talk just from my experience in sport administration is we need to stop looking at equality diversity and inclusion as projects that stop and start um we're all how do you mean, it. How, do, how do you mean stop and so start. we're all it's like interventions so it's like okay let's plow two million pounds into um, South Asian project football do similar with the Asians in football project it, it's needed but it should be seen as a kind of startup almost like it's a business startup you could say it's a it's something it's a resource that has to go into a particular area because positive action needs to be achieved in that particular area due to underrepresentation. but I think we and and I, and I say it's like a royal we just because of my experience in sport is we do look at things as project ends but I think this is more than that. This is about how do we create behavior change? How do we create a culture that's going to go beyond the lifeline of the project? So if we're going to plow in, I don't know, you know, two million pounds, or we're going to decide to put something together over the next 12 months, how do we ensure after the 12 months that that doesn't then just stop there and then it becomes a story in history? Actually, yep. we want to be able to look back at that and say that that, was, that intervention was needed. It kick-started something but we're still seeing the kind of fruits of that labour years and years on. And it started to, that culture and that behaviour has started to ingrain into people's mind. I feel like we have to start from that point as opposed to just looking at things in a short term. And, you know, organisations like Sport England, UK Sport, we're probably saying more Sport England more than anything. You know, they're talking about tackling inequalities. Tackling inequalities is not something that you start, you know, in March and finish in April tackling inequalities of lifelong because then organizations and then communities that you're trying to tackle them inequalities with they are still going to be there after that Sundar how do you stop it becoming a tick box as a tick? yeah I think I think it's right to say that you know that's your there dog needs right more engagement from below and with the grassroots as well um and that but that you know people want to see something very quickly so it's fine to have a top 12 point plan right from the top you've got to go and do the engagement and make it co-owned what i was struck me in cricket especially and across sports is that you do your minority outreach over here engage asian communities and you do your anti-racism slogans over there for a different audience and you're missing the point about social connection about co-production in the truest sense and so i think you've got to engage across the communities properly uh, james uh, what are your two thoughts I think, yeah, I, th I think there needs to be an independent body in sport, a bit like Ofsted in education or something like that, that is able to go around purely on um, equality issues. And but wasn't, but, 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 is it, but if, if we think about every single sport, uh, if we take the ECB, who's a regulator of, 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 of cricket, isn't it ECB's responsibility in cricket to do that? I think it should be the ECB's responsibility to put this into progress and make it independent. But it's not, you know, if you actually think about it, Barney, it's not in the ECB's interest to have elements of racism popping up left, right and centre around the country, is it? Because it makes them look bad. 
Um, yeah. You know, it, there's there's a kind of an, an extent to that where if the governing body is getting peppered with racism scandals left, right, and centre, it's not making the governing body look very good. So it needs to be somebody who is not held accountable by the ECB, he's not employed by the ECB to go out there and actually look with fresh eyes and you know with with elements of good practice in in their back pocket. To actually, you know, give, to give advice. I'm not talking about punishing clubs. I'm not talking about, um, you know, blowing things open unless there's really bad e examples. But you know, give people guidance on how to do this. I mean, we talk about education and taking cricketers into the classrooms. I can tell you now that you take a cricketer into a classroom four o'clock in the afternoon. The last thing they want to do is sit there and talk, get talked to about something. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. they they're there to play cricket, and it's it's. It just goes in one ear and out the other. They're not. They're not bothered. I think the second thing as well is that the um, the pathway schemes and the way through cricket. Yeah, you know, we spoke earlier about the fact that there's a lot of participation of minority groups at grassroots level playing for their clubs, and that is not reflected on the professional um, in the professional game. And there's a reason for that. There's plenty of reasons for that. Um, I spoke to Dr. Thomas Fletcher on my podcast, and we went through this in quite a lot of detail. In the you know the there's so many stumbling blocks in that you know a lot of coaches are white you know you don't get very many um you know people of color as coaches because um they they're deemed to kind of do things slightly differently uh, you know a young um, asian player is maybe more likely to go out there and hit across the line and just be enjoying himself as a youngster and that's deemed to be not cricket by a, somebody that's looking to be um for for somebody to be playing in the v and, and stuff like that so many stumbling blocks in the pathway through from being a youngster enjoying cricket to actually having these ambitions to play for yorkshire or england or whoever um which need to be taken out of the out of the way somebody needs to actually step back and you know properly talk to people and, and investigate how those stumbling blocks can be taken out there um and yeah you know, that's not to say that yorkshire should be made up of 11 players of color you know if if yorkshire's an all all white county or the first 11's all white that's fine for me as long as everybody has had the right um you know the same amount of chances to actually represent the club and at the moment, I don't think those chances exist in the same way across the board. Well, and that brings me nicely on to Jill Rutter, Spirit of 2012, who asks a question. Do we need a complete change of management at the top of cricket to be truly inclusive sport? I want to broaden it to not just cricket, but to the whole of sport. Do we need a complete change of management? Halima. I think it comes back to James' point. People will always say you've you've got to get the best people in the job as well. You can't just give give jobs to anyone. However, at the same time, of saying that there needs to be more diversity in management, and from two two parts in that is the the seen diversity, but also the unseen. Yeah, you can have diversity at a very senior management level, but if they've all had the same upbringing, if they've all had the same level of education. The, the diversity is not going to exist apart yeah. from what you can see. So I think there needs to be diversity at both levels in order for management to be able to change their systems and their processes. It, it isn't just about everyone looking different to each other. It's also about how we all think differently, but appreciating and respecting that it's okay for people to think differently as well. And if five people are all thinking the same and one is thinking differently, it's not a case of that that one person is wrong. Is that we have to accept that that's the world that we live in. Yeah. Sundar? It's not about a complete change of management, I think. And that, that's almost ducking out of the, of the issue. I mean, obviously, if there's a very toxic culture that has been created, um, you know, then you need to have change at the top of the people who've been responsible for that. But actually, you need to need, use the experience that's there. And you also need, I think, which we're missing is a positive vision about what success looks like, because the thing that makes it a tick box exercise is the sense that this is all compliance, put in place the right reporting schemes and then say it's all done. And the positive vision is inclusion, where diversity becomes a norm. And so if it's not, you know, a third of women and then half the people are women, that becomes normal, not exceptional, that we're talking about one in six people of our in our country being black, Asian or mixed race. So you want, you know, a normal dressing room, a normal boardroom to have the right levels of diversity. Obviously, in something like football, you've got enormous diversity on the pitch and no diversity 
in most boardrooms. And so there's obviously a barrier there. But I think if people say it's time for us to get out of the way and let the people who know about this take over, you're losing what the responsibility is, which is to have these institutions, these centers of power, cultural power in our society have to be equally open. And, you know, ethnic diversity is one thing, class diversity is another thing, sexuality, gender. So just the normalness, not the specialness of somebody being there and then being asked to speak for whole groups of people. We're probably 15, 20 years away from getting there. But that's the positive vision we want. I hope uh, Farah Iqbal, uh, that answers your question about uh, tick boxes and superficiality. Let's go to Dr. Manoj um, Joshi, who's a, a DL, a deputy lieutenant. Um, how can knee-jerk responses be turned into sustainable, long-term, irreversible change? James, do you want to take that? I... I agree with the sentiment of the question, to be honest. I think at the moment we are, um, ECB is under pressure, Yorkshire is under pressure to change and change tonight uh, or today or yesterday uh, and to do things. And, you know, th this, you know, racism isn't something that has just started, is it? You know, racism has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years in various and some of our Some of our audience is, is asking, why are we still talking about it? Yeah. Um, but I think at the moment there's pressure on these organisations to change. Obviously, I mean, going back to the, the initial first question, Yorkshire, I think, had to get rid of the hierarchy at Yorkshire because they were still, you know, Halima mentioned it earlier, they were still in denial. They don't think they've done anything wrong. I think if you actually ask the outgoing chief executive if he's done anything wrong, he'd still say no, which is bewildering to me because it's quite obvious that the processes in the, in, in, you know, the, it, it just wasn't followed. So, you know, I think if it is, as Sundar said, if it is a massive um, toxic environment, you have to have change. But I think knee-jerk reactions are dangerous because you are doing it because you've been embarrassed and you're forced into doing it rather than because you see it as being the right thing to do and actually really want to own a change in society uh, and a change in cricket. So I think, you know, it needs to be fought through a lot more than that. I think, you know, you need to do the proper research. You need to go out there into the communities and ask people what their what their visions are as well uh, and actually make it a sustainable thing. Whereas I said before, everybody owns it and everybody see, see, wants to be part of it. You know, if you own something, if you're a, you know, white, brown, black, whatever, we're playing for a, a cricket club in the, you know, in Bradford or, or further afield from where I'm sitting at the moment, um, you want to actually feel as if you're part of the sport, that you own the change, that it's your change and you can see a purpose for that change and you can see it actually might, you know, might actually create something better in the future. I think the 12 point plans and just throwing them out there are done for the right reasons potentially, but I think they're dangerous because you may be not doing, you know, you, you change for sake of it and taking, taking cricket down a different path. How do you know that path's the right path? Yeah. Um, so I think you need to do it a little bit more measured than that. And change isn't going to happen next week, two weeks, next year. You know, the perfect society probably doesn't exist. Um, the, frustration, the frustration for me is that I say I've been reporting on this for 40 yeah. years. So that's two generations. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm just gobsmacked that, you know, OK, yeah, I, I'll accept that things have improved. But I'm just gobsmacked, like many in the audience, that we're still having to talk about but it. I don't think, Barney, I think a lot of white people are a, a little bit reluctant to speak on the subject. As we saw with Ryan Sidebottom yesterday, you start speaking about racism, you, you can potentially slip up and get yourself into, into trouble. Um, I think a lot of um, people from all sides don't understand the histories of, of racism. You go, like I say, it dates back hundreds and hundreds of years, racism, slavery, yeah. Uh, yeah. Martin Luther King in America, whatever else, you know, all the way through to what, what we're experiencing now. I think there have been improvements. I think people are much more likely to call people out on social media than they ever were before. Um, but I think they're also social media has given people a platform to be, quite frankly, horrific at times. And, you know, we saw that with the, the football, didn't we? And the, the end of the Euros with the, the three black lads that missed the penalties, how how that um you know, spilt over in, and brought in the worst of our society after it's, you yeah. know, the, the the beauty of that sport, you know, the, I thought Gareth Southgate and this New England and they rep, we were representing everybody was fantastic at the start of it. The, the public letter he wrote to explain why they were taking the knee and everything was, that. that's what proper inclusion and, and proper thoughts actually look like. And it's then great leadership, actually. It's yeah, great leadership. Absolutely. 
because he's then, but by he the said, time I that, made the decision and the buck stops with me. Yeah. And and by but by the time the last penalty was missed, then we saw the worst side of it, didn't we? And we saw the kind of kickback to all of that as well. And yeah, you know, so we're we're a long way from being perfect in our in our world. We're a long, long way from it. Um Halima, Liz Perbrick asks a question which I think is really apposite, which is this. How do we get people to move from being a bystander, seeing or hearing things that they don't agree with, but feeling that it doesn't affect them to taking action and not relying on the people affected to call it out? It's a brilliant question. And it, it it's at times it, it's about people's own courage. It's about people's own confidence as well and being comfortable to be in a situation where you may realise that if nobody speaks up for somebody who's been marginalised or has experienced racism or homophobic abuse or anything of the sort, am I willing to stand up, as you mentioned, push my kind of head above the parapet and, and say something about that? Because only when you do that, people will start to realise and they've checked you know, you're checking on them to say, actually, what you've said and what you've done is wrong. And I'm not comfortable being in that environment where these types of conversations are happening, where we're not being an ally with each other. But I think the challenge that you have is not many people will do that because it's easier to stay silent and just be like, oh, they didn't mean it. Or maybe you've taken it the wrong way. Or it's actually, banter. Oh, it's banter. Yes, yeah, there you go. Or it's banter. So I think the intent can always be changed over by the person saying it. Say, well, I didn't mean it like that. You've taken it the wrong way. But actually, we have to be comfortable to have the conversation to say, well, that's how you said it. This is how I took it, by the way. And some things, you know, and, and I don't want you to do it again. But having somebody else come forward and do that for you speaks volumes because it means, and, and this is the whole thing that we're trying to come to, aren't we? It's inclusion. It's belonging. Because when somebody else sticks up for me, for example, if I'm a victim of racism, when somebody else sticks up for me, I feel like I belong in that environment. And it's for organisations. So say, for example, you know, if there is abuse going on at a county game at Yorkshire, what are Yorkshire doing to put in place steps to say to people, it is OK for you to stand up to that? So and would you would you uh, uh, would you agree that? really sometimes it's so easy to put the onus on those who are the victims rather than those who see it um, and, and can intervene and step in. Yes, but in either case, whether it's the victim or whether it's a bystander or an ally, that signal really comes from organisational culture. It really comes from leadership, team leadership, club leadership, organisational leadership. Everybody knows when they're in an institution which is saying, these are the values, we stand up for this and you know we're going to stick up for it. And a culture where somebody's going to say quietly, you're right, actually, but don't get a reputation as a troublemaker. That won't go down well around here. You know which kind of institution you're in. So if you want people to be braver, then you've got to do it. I think we've seen cultural shifts in our society. I saw cultural shifts inside football stadiums. There are cultural shifts about what you do or don't do on a bus or a train, um, in the street, in the pub, up to a point, in school playgrounds, and so on. So bringing about that, people don't know what to do as a bystander, for example, on social media. So if you step in, you might have to police the internet for the rest of all time. So it's easier to step out. People, people feel that they would, um, if they saw overt racism, they would speak out and step up or would feel bad if they didn't. And then they don't quite know what to do about these grey areas and these boundaries and these things take another way. So we've got to bring that conversation out into the open and have a culture that allows that. Because otherwise you get, this is the tick box point. Here are all the codes, here are all the rules, here are the disciplinary procedures. By the way, we won't like people that use them. You, you yeah. know if that's the signal that you're getting. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I, mean I, I think McPherson helped us though, didn't he? When he said that a racial incident is in the eye of the beholder. It doesn't have to be the person who is being racially abused who reports it. It can be anybody who thinks it's a racial incident. I think that can change the culture. There's, uh, first, is a brilliant example. As James was saying, and we've seen it in sport, we've, got, we've had flashpoint approaches to race. Stephen Lance inquiry, we're all very concerned, but maybe we lose the momentum. We get the other freak scandal. Do we lose the momentum? Because we're a more diverse society, we're gonna, this is going to be around more, and so we're going to have to not just do it around flashpoints. McPherson is also trying to get us to take institutional racism more seriously. But there's a problem with trying to focus on institutions. Institutions are boring. 
And racism is exciting. It's hot. It's something people get angry about. And it's something that you sort of sounds like, you know, you're institutionally racist or you're not. We've all got journeys to go on over the next five or 10 years. We should have a, a cooler term. It's very hard to say I am I am a football club, I'm institutionally racist, but everybody's welcome. So what you have to say is that's our vision of inclusion. There are disparities, we haven't got the culture we want, we're going on a journey, but it's very hard to own, I think, institutional racism because of what the R word feels like it means. It feels like it means bad intentions, a bad heart. What it actually means is that unwittingly, despite your structures, it hasn't been as inclusive of people, but you didn't realise why you didn't notice. So I think I think we need a different way of talking about that, because I think I think the term makes people close down, bunker down, and it's very hard actually to accept it. I want to pick up on something that James said um, about uh, South Asians being seen as a, a cash cow almost, um, that, you know, that they, they weren't seen as human beings, they were seen as a financial thing. Um, Halima, from your perspective, um, is it possible that business, the business imperative can drive this? Um, I'm not talking about it being um, uh, treated as human beings, but what I'm, what I'm talking about is, is quite simple. We know that when sponsorship is taken away, we know when people take away their business, uh, change happens. And I just wonder whether we... Uh, acknowledge that and, and, and use diversity as a business case? I think diversity needs to be a, a business case. And, and there's all the research out there that says when organisations are more diverse, not just in their kind of setups, when organisations have more diverse sponsors as well, that it attracts more people to the club and there's, you know, it increases their revenue, their productivity. But you don't look at these communities as, you know, as James mentioned there, you know, as cash cows. I'm South Asian, by the way, James, and I haven't got a penny, so... <laughs> Um, but I think it's important that, as you say that, this is also an opportunity now for Yorkshire to engage more with the businesses around Yorkshire. There are so many. I live in Bradford and there are so many South Asian businesses, very successful South Asian businesses that have got international recognition that Yorkshire can really start to engage with. But one of the things they have to first do is build the trust back up with these with these communities with these businesses and i almost feel that businesses hold a position that maybe in the future if yorkshire can sign a deal with some of these businesses the communities will start to look at the club in a different light because people yes. will find that, you know if you've got somebody like myla hall for example in bradford you know who decide to have a sponsorship with yorkshire how many people will look at that and thinking oh do you know what maybe there is a change here maybe there is been a shift here it might drive more people to the club james I, I um, think it's worth pointing out that when Azim first spoke up and there was an initial kind of role of support for him, there was a number of um, about 50 businesses that signed a petition or something like that to say that you know, Yorkshire should uh, do something about this. I think Azim felt very let down by those businesses um, by the end of the process because they, um, they had ended up being posing at Bradford Park Avenue cricket grounds with the club because they felt they could get something out of it. A lot of them attended, mm. they got hospitality boxes at the test match because the club was playing the game at the time. So they turned their back on their Azim, as he was, and ended up being jumping into bed with the cricket club. So I think if, you, you know, this, if you've got principles, stick by them. Yeah. And it works both ways, that. The thing I was, I was most encouraged James. by, James, um, uh, in terms of sponsors, was in that point when the story had broken and how big was it going to be. The sponsors were crucial. But the thing that really encouraged me was where Yorkshire Tea thought Middle Yorkshire was, that Yorkshire Tea thought Middle Yorkshire was about saying, sort this out now. It's unacceptable. And it was important, I thought, it was Yorkshire Tea and not Nike that was yeah. doing that. I hope they were right yeah. about Middle Yorkshire. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, th I think that, that the there were two things, I think, really caught fire in Azim's situation. There was um, the Saqib Javid and his tweet. And then there was the sponsor starting to vacate the website and saying, we're not going to we're, we're not happy to support you on this. So there was the financial and, and PR embarrassment at the same time, wasn't there? Yeah. Rosa Arias Yeg. I hope I pronounced your name right, Rosa. Forgive me if I haven't. Um, she says, people who suffer racism are perceived as less professional when they call it out. And what she's suggesting is allyship. Allyship is the key, since allies have a safer position to speak up. 
would anybody disagree with that on the panel? Because I, I certainly think that if you are part of a family, if you are part of the tribe and you see something happening, and it's happened to me where people have stepped in, um, where I've needed that friendship, that allyship, uh, and, and as a person of colour, um, I felt more secure when I know that somebody who is white has stuck up for me and said, no, you can't do that. Can I just jump in there quickly, Bunny? I think it is really important. Absolutely don't disagree with that statement. Um, however, through kind of a, a lived experience of my own in, in a previous previous roles and what I see going on as well is, I think sometimes it depends where that allyship comes from in the chain, um, in the chain of command. And I think if your ally is somebody who's in a senior leadership director position, they will probably be more likely to be noise made. But as if that ally is somebody maybe who's as your peer or working in yeah. more of a grassroots, yeah. it's you still need that as a human being. Let you know after everything it's that's people said in power, isn't it? Sweat. It's what goes yeah. back to Sundar's point, which is about leadership. Yeah, and yeah I, I, think, I think I think we've also heard from James there. James, you've been a very good ally um, and using you know the voice you have by being there for the long slog. So I think yeah. allyship matters a lot. I'm quite sceptical of a lot of the um, American discourse around allyship because it's almost like it's almost like a sort of white liberal conversation uh, among white liberals. And I think I think institutions just need to be normally diverse and re reflect all of the diversity. So I think all of this stay in your lane, check your privilege stuff can put allies off actually, to some extent. But we should, you yeah, know, we need shared identities, shared culture, shared responsibilities. There's no doubt that support from people who are from majority background, though, you know, makes a difference, makes a big difference. OK, we're in the final five minutes and I just want to go through the panel. Um, I am uh, Boris Johnson with my tasseled hair and you have a chance to uh, address me um, with one point, just one point, what, what are you going to ask the Prime? What's your ask of the Prime Minister? Uh, James. Flippant one resigned, but that's a totally different thing. Um, <laughs> that, that may be come down to uh, lockdowns and parties. But uh, I, I think, um, I mean, I, they, the government ran a, a, an investigation where they basically said institutional racism didn't exist. So I don't think Boris is the right person to talk to to be mm. quite frank, because institutional racism is rife. It's, it's everywhere. And it's just the way it's the way the, the country is, isn't it? And it's, it's just the it's because the country is run by white people, primarily for white people. And it's having to change because, as Sundar said, you know, the, you know there are more and more um, people of colour coming into the country. And I think, you know, just gen just a general point for me to finish with. I think I've learned more about race and racism in the last 18 months than I ever really wanted to. And, uh, you know, I started to own it myself now and started to call people out. I, in the past, I haven't called people out at times, and I'm, I'm ashamed of that. Um, and I think that, you know, my, the majority of my learnings have come from mixing with people who are different to me. And I think until you start doing that and you still, until you start talking to people that come from different religious backgrounds, different cultures in different countries, I'm, I'm the sort of person that goes on a holiday, doesn't sit, doesn't sit around the pool, but goes off and eats local food and talks to local people. And I think by doing that, you learn far more about people. And then when it comes down to it and you're working in, the, in an organization um, with other people, you, you, you kind of understand them already a little bit more and, you, and, and it's easier, isn't it? I think far too, there's far too much trust and people from both sides st stand away from each other. We need to kind of get, get down and dirty and talk to people a lot more. Sunder? Um, I, I'm happy to have a message to Boris Johnson or to Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak next or Keir Starmer. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's this, were the race unites or divides? very much depends on how that public conversation is framed or led. So we had an exceptionally polarised debate about the Sewell report into different camps, who was in denial, what was going on. And yet, and yet some months later, we can all agree that Yorkshire County Cricket Club has got a problem of institutional racism. And in a way, I think Saji Javi did a great thing there with the intervention he made, bringing the government behind that, probably because they learnt something from the footballers taking the knee and the way the public reacted. So I thought that was a positive chance to have a less polarised debate. We're going to be talking about this more. It's got a lot of heat in it. And I think our leaders can put the heat in or they can help to manage the heat and help us try and find the common ground. And actually, you get a much more American culture that we don't want, Donald Trump's America, if, if they choose to dial up the heat on all sides. So that, that will be my message to the current or next leader. Halima, you have the final word. Um, 
oh, I'll be saying to Boris, thank you for your time. I've got this now. <laughs> so, um, no, look, I'll, I'll keep it quite simple. And I suppose this, whether it's Boris or whether it's the ECB, Yorkshire Cricket or any sporting institution, I would be saying to them, if you are going to provide a service to communities and people, understand them before you want them to understand what you want them to do. And it's as simple as that. Panel, I, I want to thank you very much. And, and just let me just sum up. I think the messages I'm getting and uh, it's from the chat and, and thank you to everybody who has contributed to this wonderful debate. Thank you to British Futures and to the Asian Media Group for organising it. I think we know that we've got lots to do and it's going to take time before we actually nail it, if ever we do. It's not just about cricket. It, it involves the whole sport. Um, I know people get twitchy about this, but uh, because, you know, business, we always argue about the business case. Uh, and, you know, that there's that there are people who, who say, let's not just concentrate on what we can get out of uh, ethnic minorities, uh, but what we can actually put in. It's about leadership and political intervention and that we ask real people uh, for their ideas to join in and have real conversations. So on that note, thank you ever so much. Um, if you've enjoyed today's event, my name is Barney Chowdhury. If you haven't, it's George Alagaya. Good night. God bless. Bye bye.